to me, grinding is everything. To, to make the to grind that blade, that's the coolness. And I spent a lot of time doing the grinds and showing grinds off on my feet and stuff like that, just because that's to me. If you can't grind it properly, you know, it, it's just a turd that's all polished up. And I, <laughs> I would much rather have a really cool ground blade. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your hosts, Jim Person and Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Hello, Knife Junkies. Welcome to episode number 44 of the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Jim Person. And I'm Bob DeMarco from the KnifeJunkie.com. Welcome to the show. Welcome to 44 of the Knife Junkie Podcast, uh, another interview show today. But before we get into that, Bob, uh, I want to talk about a couple of things. The collection selections on YouTube keep rocking and rolling, but also want to mention the uh, reviews of the podcast. I don't think we've ever asked anybody to uh, give us a rating or give us a review, and uh, it's certainly would be helpful for folks to do that, but uh, just kind of wanted to mention uh, a couple of the reviews that we've gotten so far. Hmm. Um, one of them says, uh, great podcast, friendly, informative, and to the point. And that's kind of what we wanted to uh, to have on the podcast. Yeah, yeah. I, I wish I could be more like that in my real life. I mean, I think I'm friendly <laughs> and, you know, like most people, I think I'm informative and that no one really likes that part. Um, but you're talking about getting to the point part. Yeah. And, and see, I'm having a hard time getting there even right now. <laughs> But yeah, that was just one of the reviews. Another five-star review says, uh, great podcast, looking forward to it every week, uh, has the great, uh, has the best guest speaker list. Uh, and that's uh, kind of also what we were uh, looking for on the podcast here is to bring Knife Junkies, the uh, the best, brightest, the newest, the oldest. Anything going on in the knife world, we wanted to be the ones talking about it. So, yeah. uh, well, I got to say, I'm I'm humbled and flattered that I think it's I think it's amazing, Jim. You know, you and I started this uh, less than a year ago, just getting together, talking about knives and podcasting things we love. And I just think it's uh, it just makes me feel great that other mm -hmm. people like to listen to this kind of yammering. And I know they're coming to listen to the guests. These are the people that make this knife world, this thing that we love, make it mm. possible. And I, I, I love talking to them and kind of getting down, down to the bottom of it. So right. I'm, I'm flattered and I, I, I'm so happy people like the show and, you know. I hope right. that continues. Well, absolutely. And we'd love to uh, get your feedback. Please uh, leave us a rating and review, maybe on your uh, Stitcher or podcast player app. Just give us a, a thumbs up, five stars, whatever you want to want to do. Let us know you're you're liking it. And uh, as one of the reviews says, we've we've got a great guest interview list and we're always looking for new guests. If you would like to be a guest on the show or you know someone who'd be a great guest. Email Bob at bob at com or call the listener line, 724-466-4487. That's 724-466-4487. We'd love to hear from you with uh, suggestions about uh, guests here on the podcast. Bob, uh, mentioned the YouTube channel. You're still going strong with the collection yeah. selection videos. I think as of our show recording uh, publishing today, you're at like 30 episodes yeah, of yeah, that already. Yeah, I think uh, today will be 30. I'm having a blast with these, Jim. As you you know, I've always had a problem with consistency in my life, and uh, this it, I'm just having fun doing these every day. It's mm -hmm. it's it's kind of a, a moment I can break away from whatever I'm doing and feature whatever knife I've carried. Now, usually I decide in the morning I, I should I should videotape this, so I'll bring that knife and then and then I'll mm -hmm. talk about it. And I'm just having a great time doing it. So uh, I got a lot of knives to tick through. A lot there are mm -hmm. a lot more left, and I've decided I'm doing at some point I'll do all my slip joints and um, you know. I'm, I'm working in my fixed blades and my swords right. and my ethnographic weapons, you know. So I got a lot of stuff, and, and these are just uh, really fun to do. So Putting you back in touch with maybe some knives you hadn't carried in a while? Yeah, it, it's, that's exactly right. And, uh, you know, I started this with sell, selling in mind. And, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll carry it one last time, and, and I'll, I'll make a, a video archive of it, and then I'll sell it off. I know I always had it, but reconnecting with these knives as you put it has made me want to keep them so <laughs> uh, there we go darn if you do darn if you don't right <laughs> exactly <laughs> I want to remind folks, the Knife Junkie podcast is brought to you by QuickBooks Self-Employed. It's your year-round tax solution. 
it's definitely a must-have for contractors, freelancers, knife makers, anyone who's in business and who is self-employed. If you go to the knifejunkie.com slash QB30, Knife Junkies will get a free 30-day trial of QuickBooks Self-Employed. Again, 30 days for free at the knifejunkie.com slash QB30. Bob, we uh, talked about one of the reviews, talking about the great guest list we had, and who's up for today's show? Well, uh, today I'm talking to a legend of tactical folding knives, Greg Lightfoot. He's been in the game since the early 90s, and uh, I initially tuned into him because of his shark logo. I've always been somewhat obsessed with sharks. And, uh, and then got to know his, his gorgeous knives, uh, earlier on in, with some of his, uh, collaborations. And, uh, and now he's just, he's just making these incredible custom handmade knives in his shop and, uh, using kind of the highest end materials he can find. And, and they're just crazy. So yeah, his, his shop out in the, out in the woods, right? Yeah, he lives in Alberta, Canada. He he has a, like a 165 acre ranch. Nice. Which just sounds dreamy to me, man. I, <laughs> you yeah. know, the grass is always greener. That's right. In uh in Ottawa. I mean, not in, Ottawa. In, Cal- in the great in the great wide north. <laughs> yes. Yes, exactly. A <laughs> A What do you say we get to it? Let's do it. All right, here we go. Follow the Knife Junkie on Instagram at the knifejunkie.com/instagram. Greg Lightfoot, thank you so much for coming on the Knife Junkie podcast. No problem. Pleased to be here. I've been uh, looking at your knives for a long time. I've been aware of you for a long time. I've been collecting knives for quite a while. And your career so far spans 30 years. Uh, I believe you became a, a, a knife maker true and true in 1991, kind of at the birth of this sort of uh, tactical folding knife era. Yes, I did. Uh, Ernie was very popular back then, Ernie Emerson. So tell me, how did you get into knife making and, and when, you know, Tell me how this happened. Well, I was a, I was a machinist um, at one time, and I quit that job, and I went to the Rocky Mountains, and I was tree planting and reforestation, living in the bush. And I went to town on a day off and saw a magazine called Knives Illustrated. And I had, before I had gone on the tree planting job, I had got this book called How to Make Knives by David Boy. And it was made in 1973 is when that book was, was done. And it interested me a lot. And when I found that magazine on my days off from tree planting, people were making a living making knives. And I thought, that's pretty cool. And I think I can do that. So that's, that's basically how it started. And I was making them out of saw blades, just like the book and uh, very archaic way of doing it. But it seemed that every time I made one, somebody was interested in it. I either traded it for something or I sold it and it just kept on going from there. And I got continually more equipment and better equipment and then realized that making them out of buzzsaw blades the way David did wasn't the ticket. You had to do it a bit different to, to make money. So, you live up in Alberta, and I don't think I've ever been there. As a matter of fact, I know I've never been there. But my impression of it is as kind of a, a rugged, rough-hewn territory. What What are the kind of things you use your knives for personally on, on a sort of uh, day-to-day? Well, if, see, for me, I, I've specialized in high-end pocket knives basically now in my career. But I still would have, if I'm going to do something with a knife, it's going to be I raise grass-fed beef, and I raise pheasants. And so the butchering of that type of an animal would be part of it. But that's not really, you know, I used to do a lot of fish filleting knives and so on as well, but it's my career has changed in the last probably 15 years more so than any. It's it's just the tactical pocket knife and high-end pocket knives in a tactical format, meaning that the designs I do and build, they can go either way, high end with fancy materials, or they can go tactical with carbon fiber and green micarta and that kind of thing. So for what I would use my knives for, basically, is that question is I don't really use the pocket knives per se if they're high end. Like if it's a high end material, it's a collector. He wants it because – 
it looks cool and it has mammoth tusk and so on. But then you got the other end, the guy that can't afford that much or that expensive of a knife. He will go for that straight tactical, the same blade basically, but with different materials. So I hope I answer your question right there. I don't like the, the knives. I'm not going out every day and gutting a buffalo and right. stuff like this, you know. Well, I guess I I know you're an outdoorsman, and I figure in your outdoor activities, knives play into it. And I would imagine it's not the knives you make, and yet, uh, you know, as a hardcore user, and then a maker of these beautiful um, works of of design and art, um, it's it's kind of a funny contrast to me. Tell me a little bit about your design inspiration. I know you take inspiration from sharks. What's that all about? Well, the the shark to me was always the apex predator type. And the look of the shark swimming and just sitting sitting still, it still looked fast and dangerous to me. And back in the day when I was really using my knives for stuff, I was building knives for hunting hogs with with dogs that I was raising. And so we would stab these hogs with a special, with a certain type of a knife. You could basically use any knife, but at the time I was making special hog hunting stuff and and with fancy tips that wouldn't break off and so mm-hmm. on. And the, the, the shape of the shark's head and teeth took a big time play into how I was doing designing. When I, the, the blade shape sort of looked like the shark and the, the tip had the, telltale you know shark meanness to it and the tips didn't break off when i stabbed the hog so that was that's where my signature subsonic tip design came from which i've carried over into these pocket knives was because of big fixed blade activity back in the day is the subsonic tip is that the one where the uh, kind of a deep swedge kind of comes right to the front and then stops yeah it's only on one side so it, it makes the blade like a bullet, so it actually will penetrate, but it's not like a fine, fine little needle point. It'll just break off if you, you know. People tend to use a big, big knife for all sorts of things, whether it be cutting and pry barring. So if you don't put the proper tip on when you're, you know, when you're really going to use a knife, it will break. And that's what's cool about the stuff that I do, and what I think people like is, is because. The models, yeah, they come with high-end Damasteel and Timascus and Mammoth Tusk and Pearl, but the shape and the usability is there if you chose to be well-heeled enough to use a knife of that expense to pry, you know, pry apart pork chops and stuff like that. You could. So it, it just functional art is how the, these things have sort of ended up. That's actually something I was going to ask you. I mean, there there's such an obvious um, attention paid to the aesthetics. They're they're absolutely beautiful, and then you push every possible material to the limit. And my question was going to be, how robust are these beautiful things? You know, you 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 think of works of art as things that you don't want to, you know, touch. <laughs> well, you see, back in the day, you know, I, I would get a knife back because the tip was snapped off or the clip had broken off or there was a, you know, there was a great big gouge in the handle, but you know, the guy could care less. He said, man, this thing is sweet. It feels great in my hand. Can you please sharpen it for me? And I go, okay, I'll, no, I'll give you a full refurb because I'm, I'm really happy that you're using it. He, you know, and now it's to the point where you've made the thumb stud too sharp. It hurts my thumb. <laughs> my finger is sore. Because nobody cuts nothing with them. <laughs> they just flick them while being on the phone or watching a Rambo movie. Okay? And it, so I get the knife back, totally thrashed, and it's razor sharp. Okay? Because he's flicked it a thousand times. So you have to put lock faces, stainless lock faces in and all sorts of other stuff to stop that from happening now. And that's fine. I have no problem with that, but it's a totally different you know, a group of people now from back in the day when I was selling to military guys and firemen and rescue and these guys that just wanted something that was seriously strong and could cut. Uh, that's kind of funny you say that. The, the first time I remember seeing or hearing the word comfort in a knife review on YouTube, I was kind of like, huh? Like, I, I okay, I guess if you're flicking it open a million times, it's going to wear on your thumb. But but aren't we supposed to be tough? Like we're knife users. Isn't this supposed to be part of our, and, uh, 
you know, now I, I will admit if, if it's, if it's too sharp a flipper, I'm like, man, this is, this is killing my buzz. What, what do you think of today's knife market of uh, today's collectors? Well, like for me, I, I have a great clientele. Like, I mean, there's people that are getting my stuff always reorder. And I mean, that's a, that's kind of a, the best compliment. Like you can have sunshine blowing up your butt all day long, but if the guy's not buying more, it's not really the, you know, the, to me, th- that's the compliment part. So, no, well, I have, I'm, with where I am today, I would not be without the people that, that love my product. And so I'm, I, you know, I make jokes about, you know, the, the, the turning my finger and whatever, but <laughs> that just happens to be, you know, the, the way it is now. And you, so you build accordingly, like you, you dull these, the, the flippers down and you do things to make it, you know, so it does back in the day, the edgy angles were cool because it didn't rotate in your hand and now, and now it has to be a bar of soap, like very smooth <laughs> and silky, right? Which I can make either or. couch fondling. Yeah. <laughs> you bet. <laughs> so, um, mentors coming up, uh, you start in around 1991. Who, who were the people along the way that, uh, taught you a thing or two? Well, you know, I learned the bulk of this by myself because I was so far away but from anybody. But there was a gentleman named Rod Olson. And Rod Olson, he, he made pocket knives from basically from day one. And I remember going to a show in, in this city called Calgary, Alberta, where the 80 Olympics was. And they had a show there. And I met Rodney there. And I couldn't believe how awesome his pocket knives were. And I... So I was kneeling in front of his table, Googling this, this pocket knife. And he's, he took a great big drag and a cigarette and said, you, you making knives or <laughs> pocket knives? And I said, yeah, I can't believe how nice he started. So I showed him mine and he said, you should come to my shop. So he saw some potential and you should come to my shop. And, and he, he taught me lots of cool stuff in folders, design and so on. Tony Marfione was the one that taught me how to grind. <laughs> like the, the way I speed bomb hollow grind right now, back in the day I was doing my, all my own freehand flat grinds back in the day. And back in 1999, I went to see Tony in Vero Beach, Florida, and he and he invited me to come. And he said, and he showed me how to do that. So that's two very influential people that, that you know, got me to the to, to today i i don't really watch knife makers at all really like mm-hmm. if i do it my own way it makes it different because there's so many cookie cutter models out there that it's exactly the same as the last one that i i didn't want to be influenced by that so but design now in my career i've actually added a couple new designers to my roster guys that have designed knives on paper and then I've made them up because, you know, they were, they had neat ideas and that's Jared Van Otterloo is one of them. And Lorian Arnold is another guy that, that I've, you know, I've decided to take on their design ideas and then mix them with mine. Was it similarities with your style and your design instincts or was it contrast that attracted you to their work? Um, basically the, with Jared, it was the fact that he was, he was younger and, and a knife junkie. Okay. Like he, and so, and I was, you know, not paying attention to that end of it very much. So, and, and so, and so he, he said, no, like, but you got to get on Instagram and you got to do, you know, these things that mm-hmm. I just wasn't familiar with. And, you know, he had ideas and that punched me out there into this new group of people that weren't, you know, as, as much of a user as more as collectors and wanted the, the, the best materials, you know, the, and also uh, I wanted to say that the ability to work with the natural materials is my forte. And that's why, you know, I was to work with woods and pearl and mammoth and all these different things. Mm-hmm. I find that to be the most fun 
and where I'll spend my time. You know, I made a million black pocket knives, you know, with carbon fiber. And it's not that really hard to do. Where you want to show your skills, you know, get a deep, straight hollow grain and use wood or pearl or mammoth tusk. You know, those things of what the point being here is the, those boys designed cool knives that had my some of my ideas and some of my flair. But when I then put those materials, those natural materials, those those things become warm and alive. They're yes. not just a you know a, a punched out model anymore. Yes, and and there's such a beautiful contrast between such modern designs and lines uh, with uh, in terms of pocket knives with these ancient, literally ancient materials, natural materials. I, I love that contrast. I have a, a, a fantasy knife growing in my mind. I don't, I don't know whose it is or exactly what it is, but it's a modern knife with the most beautiful stag. I'd love stag all of a sudden. It just sort of popped out of nowhere. It's the best, but it's hard to get unless you're making little little knives. You know, mm -hmm. in in the pocket knife realm, if you know if you're making fixed blades, you can get a stick tang out of a stag, no problem. But you know, I, I was notoriously known for making big, you know, bigger knives. And as of late, I've scaled it down. I'm like a full contact fighter was a knife of mine that that ran the work the world I get I made so many full contact fighters because of the mixed martial arts thing and all that yeah and it was a big knife and now you know with Laurie and Arnold design we've got some the endorphin and and the catalyst they're just they're more pocketable and they just they kind of look like a you ever looked at you know what else I get inspiration from was these knives sometimes is you know those colorful beetles like those beetles, they're yeah. small and they're iridescent and they, you know, and they, they just, under the light, they flicker, this kind of thing. And that's somewhat what these smaller pocket knives to me, huh. you know, they resemble in my mind. Okay. So obviously it's a bit different design trait than the shark, but it's still, that's where I'm taking some inspiration from with these, and all these materials that are coming out now that like this time ask you stuff with all these different patterns and so on but you know what's funny like i don't use the patterns i flip the stuff over and use the random side <laughs> because the random side is more alive to me you know it's it's more real i was gonna say that makes perfect sense if you're dealing with natural materials you're gonna want the side that takes form naturally not the side that's manipulated you bet and that's a lot of guys when they look at my stuff they go these things just look they look alive or the, the it looks like an antique gun mm -hmm. or, or, you know, it, from an old world type design. To me, that's a great compliment because I'm not trying to, you know, this going to Mars bull crap. Okay. I mean, I know I can't probably swear on this podcast, but, but, but what do you mean going to Mars? Well, frick, who the hell's going to make it to Mars? Nobody's going to Mars. They're all going to die. Like, <laughs> it's just a fucking joke, but, 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 you know, they make these, this stuff, this high tech looking, uh -huh. you know, with these, and I'm just, I'm more, I'll do some high tech looking stuff, but I tend to bring it back to, to warmth and to alive as opposed to straight titanium as an example. You said something interesting in a, in a video I saw of you where you mentioned the recurve and, and how it's just sort of inherently appealing it is. And you ask a stranger, what do you want, but this or the straight? And people will naturally go to the curve. But there's this prevailing attitude in the knife world at large that uh, recurves are just unsharpenable. And so, to you know, oh, I would love this knife. If it didn't have a recurve, and that's a, a deal breaker. And to me, I'm like, well, that that's easily handled with a with a circular ceramic rod or a, a sharp maker. That like there are ways, you know, other than who, who's who's sharpening on big flat stones. People who are experienced with that. So my my point is, I agree with you about the recurve. Tell me about some of your blade shapes. You you say you're not going to Mars with them, but they're they're very unique and very modern in a lot of ways and yet organic and natural seeming. The Millennium Tanto, 
you know, back in 2000 was something that I brought in. And, and it was, it had that, that sort of like that, that Japanese flair, but yet with the North American spin on it. And now with, with these, the way I'm doing these grinds now with the sub, still incorporating the subsonic tip, but you, you're, you're kind of having a heavy recurve at the back, which joins into a straight canto, a squared off canto in the, at the tip. And those contrasting, that contrasting mix there really looks cool. It's, a, it's, a, it's an eye catcher. And if you then take those grinds and you blacken the grinds and then mirror polish or satin finish the flats, mm. you end up with unbelievable contrast, but extremely cool grind lines that are sticking, that are just in your face. Like it's, it's showing that the grind is perfect yeah. because you're not trying to hide anything. Okay. It's like, yeah, I did a, I did a great grind there and here's why, because I accidented it with black and then put it, joined it up to, to, a, to a real shiny finish. You, it was screwed up. Yeah. You would instantly see it's, it's a right, bad right grind. On. Yeah. You know? So, and that, that's part of this. It's like, to me, grinding is everything to make the to grind that blade that's the coolness and i spent a lot of time doing the grinds and showing grinds off on my feet and stuff like that just because that's to me if you can't grind it properly you know it, it's just a turd that's all polished up and i <laughs> i would much rather have a really cool ground blade well you were you're you keep saying cool which to me is talking about aesthetics but but when you're talking about that recurve that's close to the handle within a long straight tanto tip like that that's the best of both worlds in terms of cutting um you know you got you got the the capturing ability of that curve and then you have all of the other utility of that straight edge so it's not just looking cool which it is but uh the recurve tanto is one of my favorite blade shapes cool yeah that's well that's that's neat to see, to hear that because that's exactly what my brain was thinking when I, you know, when when those shapes started to come together for me. Jared Van Otterloo was was one of the guys that that he kind of incorporated those two things together in a couple models that that I started building and it just took off. Like for me, that shape, you know, the, those particular shapes where you you amalgam new with the old type that, that we're coming back to that, but that tends to be the, to me, a good design. Okay. Like that's, that's a good design and design sell stuff. And I remember telling a story one time where I had a knife on a table and it was just a black prototype and a girl come along who didn't know nothing about knives. And there was always to finish knives on the table. And they asked, the person asked her, what do you think is the most sexy knife on this table? And she picks up this black prototype. There was, and she goes, this is sexy. And to me, that was a super compliment because the shape, oh, yeah. the shape brought her hand to it. You know, there was all sorts of pimped up stuff on that table, but she picked this black shape. And that was a great compliment to me. I think the straight edge. Okay. Just speaking strictly to the eye. And, and I, I, I'm talking off the top of my head right now, but you're making me think that, um, recurves and s sinuous shaped blades, like, you know, um, well, you know what I'm talking about. Kukri's and, and curvy, recurvy blades are, uh, in inherently pleasing, like on a biological level. Whereas a worn cliff, which is another one of my favorites, uh, is, is almost, um, appealing on an intellectual level. It reminds me of Vikings and it, and it's angular and not natural looking. So I mean they they both have their appeal but but uh it it's it's like the recurve appeals on a level d below. All right, that's a bunch of philosophizing. Tell me about your design process. Do you use CAD at all or are you all pencil and paper? It's basically how I design always like that. I draw in a napkin basically and then I'll take it over to a to a friend of mine who's a CAD guy and he will sit together and you know he's he's such a he's just an awesome guy because he will I don't have to use hand puppets when I'm talking with him he just if I say something he's like I right, get it I'll draw that for you and then he sends me a, a an email and I go that's 
will do this, and he goes, no problem, and it's, he, he understands the knife world, and so it's so much, you know, if I send him something and that I have an idea for, and he, he goes, you know, this just isn't going to work. <laughs> and, and I go, hey, great, well, what do, we, what do you think then? So I can, can bang it off him too. And that, that really helps because from there, it, the shapes, like my handle shapes, get, they get water jet cut out. So it has to go to a, to a shop where the handle will get cut out. And then the, I'm, I'm milling the blades out, meaning that the shape is not, it's bang on the money when it's mm-hmm. done off the milling machine pops out and all the every edge is perfect there's no curve or nothing like that so i need to have the cad to to so when i start off i start off with a perfect pieces of material you know like some guys like to start off with a piece of roadkill damascus and then they they they're able to make a knife out of that i can't i have to have kill damascus you know i have to have something that's very flat and perfect to start building my knives out of. Let me back up a little bit. You said that uh, this gentleman you collaborate with on the CAD, when he said this just won't work, is he speaking from uh, a mechanical um, perspective? He can spec it out in in the machine, basically, in the computer? He just, he has an eye for how, like, he can see far ahead. Like, when I, you know, when you put, like, he'll say, when you put the handle on this, it's going to look funny at the back here. Like, and then, so, like, I, I have a, after all these years, I can make them fold and, you know, that's not a problem, but there'll be just a slight, and it's, and it's, it's extreme, it's the details that set these things apart. Like, if you, you gotta look at that, that's very important. Like, <clears throat> so many people can make a tanto, but there's a slight little detail or something on there that's just pulling your eye there and you think, that's really sweet. And that's what this is about. And with my, with me doing it, and and then Bernie has the ability to to change up, and then you know Jared's designs coming my way, and then Laurie and Arnold's having some ideas, and so then I can sort of talk with with. It helps for me to talk to these different people, and I find, <clears throat> excuse me, the end result is something's just a tad different than what everybody else is doing, hmm. and that's important. It sounds like your level of collaboration has increased over the years. Um, it sounds like this gentleman uh, with the CAD plays a, a role. These other two younger designers play a role. Is there uh, an opportunity to get a light foot on somewhat of a budget in the future? Do you have any plans to collaborate with a Wii or a Riyadh or a, an OEM? I've tried that numerous times, and it just never seems to gel. Like, you you always get promises and and it just always dies. Like I don't know what it is, why that doesn't happen for me, but it always seems that um, something happens to quaff the deal. Okay, and so basically for me, I make a living making knives, and I mean I'm hoping I could one day you know jump in my car and go for a rip and they're selling some, but that hasn't happened. I mean <laughs> some guys, some guys are just you know, it just falls in their lap. And and I attribute it to a lot of times, too. Like, I live in Canada. And, you know, and I, I wasn't in the military. And so that tends to to pull a lot of weight. If you live in the U.S. and you were in the military at some point in time. But I was none of those things. And so, you know, I'm not crying about this or nothing. Mm. I enjoy the job, what I do. But... As you say, the, the cheap stuff, <laughs> it just hasn't happened for me. And the thing is about that, you usually have to make, they have to make thousands and then you, you know, it, it works out for the, you know, the designer or the custom maker guy. He actually makes a little bit of money, but, right. you know, it's not, it's not that lucrative as people might think, Okay. Well, I was asking from a strictly selfish point of view. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay, sorry. I'm not in the market, unfortunately, for your knives at this moment. M- maybe uh, if my five-year plan works out. <laughs> <laughs> but I, you made the full contact fighter. Didn't you collaborate with that? On Didn't didn't that make uh, – didn't someone make that? 
other than you? Well, there was a company called Timberline Knives that yes. that made that started to make it and then went under uh, like shortly after the thing came out. Like it right. never it never even really got to go anywhere. They also made the Goblin, right? The uh, that sort of famed curvy tactical knife that was made by so many different people. I well, think I think it was a Kelly Warden design. I yep. think that they they did they did a lot of Kelly Warden was a knife fighter guy, uh-huh. and Columbia River Knife and Tool way back in the day, they did a, a little knife, and it was called the Urban Shark, and that was a rock and roll high school piece. It worked great, <laughs> and, and they. They the the bar graph dropped off a little low, and then they just discontinued it. And it was like, Jeez. and people were phoning me and asking me, like, because I had no control over that, of course. Yeah, yeah. And it's like, I have no idea. You know, I I found out by a, some distributors that they couldn't get it anymore. So that was so many years ago, and it's so at, by the at, at that time, people were getting my knives for on the cheap, and they were actually working and stuff, right? But that has you know those companies that you talked about, they yeah. make absolutely unbelievable stuff. I don't know how how they can do it. Okay, and and somebody is getting a bowl of rice and a smack to build that because it's just too too high end for how much they're charging for it. Okay, would you say it's spoiling the uh, the rest of the world, the Western world, with this high quality? Well, yeah, it's like these guys are expecting you know. So now they, you know, anything that comes out, you know, you've got some some guy who's, whose job is to grind 6,000 blades. Well, he bloody well better be good after 200, and then he's still got all the rest to do. And, you know, it's just that for me, that's not what it is. I My life is seriously diverse in the things that I do. And I'm going to say this because my motto is, Create a lifestyle you don't need a holiday from, and hmm. and and knives and the people that have that like my stuff have enabled me to. to I don't mind my job, you know what I mean. But then you've got to go out, and you got to shoot sporting clays, and you got to ride motorcycles, and you got to race cars, and you got to, you know, do bug out camping, and you know, shoot archery, and ride mountain bikes. Like there's just all these things that I'm that help. And then you come back in the shop and you're all rejuved and you and you go at it again, you know. So, yeah, but I'm sorry. I kind of went off on a tangent there. But the, those guys that are making them in those countries, are, it's just jam up stuff. And everybody now expects a $15 knife to, to be perfectly ground. And these guys are – And the action and the, and the lockup. And, and, and they got to have – you know, it's going to drop clothes. And it's going to make this certain <laughs> sound and all this stuff. It cost 20 bucks. Come on. <laughs> I'm, I'm guilty of some of that, I got to say. But hey, I'm glad you meandered down that path because you said the words create a lifestyle you don't need a holiday from. That's a great encapsulation of a, of a mantra I've been trying to come up with. And okay. I, I like that. <laughs> well, it's it's me because I live on a ranch. And I mean, it's I made a lot of knives to pay for this and and I mean, people travel from all over the world to come to a place like where I live. Mm-hmm. I don't have to go anywhere because I'm already there. Wow. It's like it's it's a spot that I want to be. And I, I thank the people that like my stuff because I'm able to do a job that I like and go out and do a few other things, you know. And 31 years of doing something, though, I'll tell you, it's a long time. And I'm still I'm still okay with it. Well, before we wrap up, I'm going to ask you in a minute for a, a knife story, whatever it, it can be funny, it can be horrifying, your choice. Uh, but uh, I wanted to find out how people can find out more about you and get in touch with your knives. You know, Greg Lightfoot one two three. That's that's always up to date and always the latest, the pictures of lifestyle stuff, as well as you know knives in progress and completed knives and so on. It's all Instagram is the, is where I really spend a lot of time. Yeah. It's, it's an amazing place. It seems for uh, any visual and anyone who has something visual to sell because it's all picture dominated. And those of us who buy them males mostly are very visual people. <laughs> you know, I have, I have girls that, 
that buy too. And the thing is, you can't be, you just, you just answer the questions. And I don't mind, like, I get so many times, oh, gee, thanks for calling me back. And I go, oh, well, what is this job if I'm not going to call you back? Like, I, <laughs> I, I don't know how, they, well, no, a lot of guys won't call back. And I just can't believe that. So it's like, it's it, like a hard to get businessmen don't go too far. <laughs> yeah. So before we wrap up, do you have a knife story you could uh, impart? Something funny, something from the shop, anything? I, I'm really, I was, I'm, as you said that to me, I'm, I'm struggling to, to find a funny knife story. Like, well, I was going to say, tell me about the first knife you sold. I bet you remember that. Well, the first knife I sold started out as a great big honking Bowie, and it ended up down like a kind of a half-ass paring knife. By the time I, could, <laughs> I figured out how to get it ground properly, like my first knife I ground on a on a four-inch contact wheel made from a a caster of a of a rolling shelf you know what i mean i took caster wheels and crowned oh. them and that's so why I, I, I was freehand grinding on that's how i learned how to grind myself so i started off with something real big and i was I had all these plans and by the time i had finished it you know it was it had substantially lost size but you know <laughs> that was that's kind of a but you know that's so long ago that you you know you i think back to that and I remember using a cement mixer motor from my dad. I took it off his cement mixer and put it onto this um, this grinder. And now you you go on the internet, you can buy fifty different grinders that yeah. they're all. And at that, back at that time, that wasn't so okay. And so you, you, there would be lots of screw ups and mistakes made that at the time weren't funny, but you, know, you <laughs> think about it now, <laughs> you know they're a bit comical. Well, I could just see, you know, grinding one side perfectly, flipping it over, and doing a lame job on the other side. So you have to fix it, and each time you do that, you're taking more and more. Oh off. yeah. <laughs> and and you know, I'm thinking, you know, you use that cement mixer. You could also that could also do double duty as a stone washer. Well, there you go. <laughs> and bang them around real good. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So, uh, Greg Lightfoot, real pleasure speaking with you. Thank you so much for coming on the Knife Junkie podcast. Hey, I, I really enjoyed it. And I'm, I'm thankful that you called me on. Well, great. I can't wait to, uh, you know, I, I haunt you on, on Instagram. I can't wait to see what you have, uh, coming up after, uh, G11. Everybody check out Greg Lightfoot. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Have a question or maybe you just have a comment? Give us a call at 724-466-4487. We'll answer your question on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. All right, another pretty cool interview uh, here on the Knife Junkie Podcast, and uh, we mentioned uh, collection. We mentioned YouTube uh, Knife Junkie on the beginning, and the collection selection video still rocking strong, going on uh, as of the podcast today. Number thirty on the collection selection videos is coming out today, and uh, kind of a little special story with that one. I know all the knives are special, but a little little something <laughs> special in this one. Yeah, I uh, I hooked up with my brother-in-law yesterday who um, had a birthday present for me, and he got me the new Artisan Cutlery Kinetic Tool, which is this really, really cool and very interesting uh, mechanism that allows this knife-like object. It, it doesn't have a blade. It has a blade-like object with a bunch of tools cut into it, like cap lifters and screwdrivers and stuff like that. But it opens and closes it. The mechanism is the is the feature here. It opens and closes like a bally song and like an out the front. Uh, mm. out the side automatic. And uh, it's fascinating. Uh, we were at a barbecue yesterday when my brother-in-law gave this to me and, and me and several other men just sat around playing with it for about an hour. <laughs> uh, it's very cool. And, uh, yeah, I'm going to feature it today on, on today's collection selection. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's get back to the interview with, uh, Greg Lightfoot, uh, kind of wrap up the show, your final thoughts, final takeaways, uh, kind of what you, uh, gathered from that interview. I love when I talk to, um, these legendary designers who started off in the nineties, they all have, uh, a mind for weaponry in their, they're all aware of the fact that their knives could be used as weapons. And, you know, I always kind of harp on that. I think that that's a, a cool and kind of honest approach. This guy uses the most unreal materials to to fashion these things if if uh, people if you're listening and you don't know what a greg lightfoot custom knife looks like uh google it check it out they're dazzling and so just hearing him you know this man living in this sort of rough hewn environment 
pumping out these gorgeous, refined creations. It, I love that kind of contrast. Mm -hmm. um, and he said something that, uh, uh, that I want to keep with me, which is create a lifestyle you don't need a vacation from. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, listening to this, uh, this perspective, someone living on a ranch up in Alberta, making knives and just kind of living a cool life. It made me think, yeah, that's, a, that's a great idea. Create a lifestyle you don't need a vacation from. Take me away. <laughs> <laughs> Calgon. Yeah. Hey, that's power of advertising right that's there. You remember? Right. Yeah. But yeah, how cool is that to uh to to live your dream, live your lifestyle and make knives, man. Yeah. Just just beautiful, refined, high-end creations. Again, remind our listeners to uh to listen every week. We'll drop a new one and if you want to uh maybe suggest a guest, uh give us a call 724-466-4487 724-466-4487. Uh, if you have uh, uh, someone you think would be great to uh, interview on the Knife Chunky podcast or you yourself as a knife aficionado, aficionado however you say that, <laughs> would like to be on the uh, the podcast, give us a call or shoot Bob an email at bob at the knife junkie dot com. Well, I will say this just in closing uh, in speaking with Greg Lightfoot and other people similar to him, it just keeps reinforcing in my mind the reduce and refine mantra that I got mm. from uh, Epic Snuggle Bunny. Just, you know, I, I, I've been in an acquisitive stage of life and now i think i need to be in a in a reduce and refine stage and i would mm -hmm. love to get my hands on a greg lightfoot knife sometime in my lifetime okay there's the challenge boom mic drop right there or knife drop right there <laughs> <laughs> for bob the knife junkie demarco i'm jim person thanks so much for joining us again this week on the knife junkie podcast thanks for listening to the knife junkie podcast if you enjoyed the show please rate and review at review the for show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Mm -hmm.